Good morning, everybody. Today we are going to learn about sickle cell disease and how we know closer crisis is just not about RBCs alone. So today's topic would be to understand we know closer crisis, which is an inherent and very important part of life of sickle cell disease. Today's program has been helped by Novartis to create awareness about sickle cell disease. And uh, thanks to the newer drug, Rivarna, we have been able to help in the quality of life of our patients. So in the next few minutes, few slides, I will be talking about this, of this topic, about venoclusive disease, just not being about RBCs, it's about more than RBCs. Thank you very much for joining today, and we'll be starting a lecture pretty soon. Thank you. Today we're going to speak about sickle cell disease and thinking about beyond sickling. That's very, very important for us. I'm Dr. Vijay Ramanan. I'm the director of MVR Welfare Foundation. I'm a clinical hematologist based out of Pune, and I have a deep interest in sickle cell disease and thalassemia for the last decade and a half or so. This program is with the help from Novartis. But the disclaimer is uh, the old opinions that are mentioned today in this presentation are mine and not related to no artist. So this is only for educational purposes and uh, nothing should be derived out of the sites. Traditionally, sickle cell disease pathology was thought to be due to vascular blockages caused by sickle, sickle RBCs. For many, many decades, people were taught, I was also taught during our pathology days. It's the RBCs which get sickled because of low oxygen and ultimately got, get stuck in the circulation. But what's very important to understand is the sickle cell pathology, that the physiology goes beyond RBCs. It's very, very important for us. It's not just the RBCs, the WBCs, the platelets, and the endothelium, and the inflammation around them is very, very important. Very important to remember is all the RBCs are softer shaped. They are saucer shaped so that they can twist and turn at a wet, at turns wherever it has to go through the smallest of vasculature. And they can withstand the deoxygenated blood for a longer period of time. So only the morphological changes in the RBC shape cannot explain vascular occlusion. And for many, many years, people were trying to find out the reason for the same. And ultimately, they came up and they found out a lot of things in the pathophysiology. The vascular damage in sickle cell disease uh, also involves the WBCs, the platelets, and the endothelial cells. So the key drivers of this occlusion are endothelial activation, endothelial activation leading to enhanced additions of all the types of cells, neutrophil activation leading to inflammation, polymerization, and ultimately chronic hemolysis, which causes all this to happen. Activation of WBCs promote interaction with the Endothelial cells will promote interaction with the RBC, your platelets, and ultimately release of pro inflammatory cytokines. So, WBCs have multiple selectins which are there, which I'll show you in the next few slides. Ultimately, this interaction leads to the activation of the leukocytes, and which ultimately leads to secretion of pro inflammatory cytokines, which ultimately activates the platelets and the extracellular trap around the platelets. Ultimately, this activation of platelet causes small flux to happen. And this chronic inflammation that goes on ultimately damages the endothelium. Now, platelets express addition molecules that bind to the sickle RBC. Like, like the WBCs, even the platelets express um, molecules. So they express the T-selectins and the other selectins, which, are, which ultimately allow them to bind to the, uh, to the sickle RBCs. Sickle RBCs have a T-selectin ligand. So ultimately that binds to the P-selectin on the platelets, ultimately causing a plug. So the whole, whole thing of activated platelet getting stuck to the WBC and the WBC getting stuck to the endothelium and the RBCs ultimately leads to a, a base occlusive crisis. So very important thing is we always forget endothelial cells. These are the most important cells and uh, 
and the non-metable nature of them allows us to live a normal life till the time they get broken. So in, in sickle cell disease, they are broken by the WBC, they're broken by the inflammation, they're broken by the RBCs, and ultimately with the hypoxia and a hemolysis. So when this activation uh, occurs, there's endothelial damage, higher expression of P-selecting occurs on them, ultimately more RBCs get stuck to the endothelium, causing more amount of deoxygenation in the site. Ultimately, this is a vicious circle which continues till there's a total occlusion. So pathological mechanisms uh, that lead to development of multiple additions and the vasoclusion feedback uh, ultimately leads to, as I told you, increasing vasoclusion process. So hemolytic anemia with vasoclusion causes more tissue hypoxia, which ultimately um, causes more vasoclusion. There's a reperfusion injury that may occur at the same time. If there is free radical injury that occurs, which ultimately exacerbates the whole endothelial cell damage and tissue inflammation, increasing the expression of adhesion molecules. This elevated inflammatory markers and expression of adhesion molecules result in more recruitment of RBCs, more sickling, more WBCs, more platelets, everything is increased. And ultimately, we have a hodgepodge where there's a venous vasopressive vis crisis. So this is a whole thing which continuously goes on. A vicious circle goes on. The catch-22 never ends. And ultimately, we have the whole whole process coming to a culmination or may not come to a culmination that the organ starts getting damaged. To summarize, very important, the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease and vasoclusive crisis goes beyond the RBCs. Remember, it goes beyond the RBCs, not just the RBCs. And the key drivers are endothelial activation, enhanced addition, neutrophil activation, and silvipleted activation, polymerization of the sickle RBCs, and chronic hemolysis. So not one, multiple factors are there. And there's a vascular damage which continuously occurs in sickle cell disease, which involves WBC platelet and endothelial cells. Now, from the pathophysiology, we'll we will come to uh, what is about painful years. Everybody knows about pain. We know about pain, which is very, very sensitive. We are brain, our brain is sensitized to pain, but we are not sensitized to non-painful things. Now, painful VOCs are very easier to appreciate. So you could have, but they end up having uh, hypoxia, ischemia, tissue damage when it is in subclinical phase, when there's less amount of pain. So each VOC, as I explained previously, has inflammation associated. More inflammation means more worsening, more recurrent episodes, and ultimately serious end organ damage. So very, very important to remember the same. Every VOC has four stages. First is the predominant phase, when the patient says, I feel something funny is happening. Second is the initial phase, where there's a pain which just spikes up. And then the established phase, when the pain continues for long, long days, for three, four days, ultimately the resolution occurs in about three, four days. So the whole process takes around 10 to 12 days. Prodrome, you may have this weird symptoms of numbness, paresthesia, ache. Initial phase, as I said, pain increases. Established phase, the pain continues, and the quality of life is affected. Joint depression may be there. Inflammation may be there. Ultimately, uh, all these phases are seen in acute chest syndrome. Multi-organ failure may occur. Even death can occur during this whole phase of established phase of VOC. Resolving phase of pain, because of all RBCs break down, there's a hemolysis. So the pain resolves, but there's a drop in hemoglobin at that time. So you can have an acute crisis where you have depth in the middle, but they could have a chronic crisis where the speed of prodromal phase in fact increases and this thing continues. So you could have continuous amount of cycling crisis with some small amount of resolution of pain. VOCs are like the iceberg phenomenon. Clinically visible painful crisis is is much less than the subclinical painless silent going on process where there's multicellular addition, inflammation, cell activation, endothelial damage, which leads to silent cerebral infarcts. You may have ILDs, you may have renal damage. So many of the sickling uh, areas of sickle have a lot of renal failure, a lot of ILDs, a lot of cardiac events, a lot of moya moya, and a lot of silent cerebral infarcts. So we should remember that VOC is just the tip of the iceberg. Painful VOC is the tip of the iceberg. So as we said in the previous slides, it's the inflammation cell activation. 
with multicellular adhesion, with adhesion WBC, platelet, everything getting adhered to the endothelium, which ultimately leads to is occlusion and is occlusive crisis. When it occur, when it affects the nerves, it becomes a painful VOC. But if you don't, even if you don't have painful VOC, still you are having end organ damage. The moral of story is you have many actors. You have the neutrophils, you have the RBCs, you have the platelets, and the endothelium. So the sickle RBCs, are, you can see there, the normal RBCs on the uh, right hand side, the normal RBCs are something called a uh, P selectins and the P selectin ligand. The P selectin is expressed over endothelium. Activated endothelium expresses more amount of P selectin, so they'll, more, they'll get attached to more WBCs, more neutrophils, more RBCs, everything. And they have a E selectin, which is also there on the neutrophil, which again uh, binds to the endothelium. And then there's an L selectin, which is there for interneutrophilic uh, addition. So in, important point to remember the E, the P, and the L, all of them are expressed on the neutrophil. Ultimately, the neutrophil is a central uh, figure in the whole vase evolution. Remember that the survival, at least in India, is probably 30 to 40 years. This is a broad 56 years, and as you use probably more and more agents like the chrysanthemum, which prevents the uh, vasoclusive crisis, we would probably see a better quality of life and better and longevity in our patients. So, um, VOCs affect multiple organs, as I said, brain in 25% of people uh, in the lifetime. I think even more than that. And if we don't investigate them with routine MRIs, they could be 40 50% by the age of 30 years. Sick, uh, renal failures occur, reproductive system problems occur, priapism can occur, women have increased risk of VOC during menstruation, lungs, acute chest syndrome affects them, pulmonary yeah, hypertension can occur in 20%, and also remember, uh, ILD can occur, liver damage can occur in 40% of people. Ultimately, sickle cell disease is not single, it's not just RBC disorder, it's a multi-system systemic disorder, inflammatory disorder. So, the clinical severity of sickle cell disease can be unpredictable. It can go from over to silent infarct to acute chest syndrome to pulmonary hypertension to chronic pain, preapism and impotence, chronic anemia, nephropathy, liver cell failure, retinopathy, heart disease, clinic sequestration and clinic uh, uh, infarctions, risk of infections, arthropathy, avascular necrosis, vertebral collapse and leg ulcers. Name the thing, this can all happen. P patients can deal with the pain, but the problem is ultimately physical cell disease beyond the pain. So there are multiple organs that are involved. The important point for every sickler is practical is good, have good hydration. Whenever there's a pain or think of the prodrome, think of oxygen. Maintain your temperature and maintain your pH. Never go into acidosis, go into an alkali state. Have adequate sleep, don't have too much emotional strength. Emotional stress, have a lot of emotional strength. And blood transfusion may be given if there's a lot of pain. That's very, very important to remember. So uh, the good hydration prevents the RBC from getting de uh, dehydrated. When you are hydrating a sickler, probably you have a little bit hypotonic solution. That's very, very important. You can have 5% dextrose or a DNS. Adequate sleep uh, reduces the amount of inflammation. Avoidance of emotional stress also does the same thing. Temperature management is very important because it prevents vasoconstriction and prevents the deoxygenated state. Uh, blood transfusion is usually given there's anemia. If there's anemia or there's an acute chest syndrome and or there's a plastic crisis, otherwise we try to avoid the same. But when there's a drop in the hemoglobin in the resolving stage of the VOC, at times the hemoglobin drops and we have to give the same. There are exchange transfusions which are done. Um, which could be done, but I, I would prefer just giving a transfusion to come to a hemoglobin of 10 to 11, that's also good enough. Volume overload may, may have to be prevented. These are the side effects which can occur. And very important to remember that ciclers have alloimmunization, and one of the highest levels of alloimmunization, so giving blood transfusion is not a solution as such. The only drug which has been proven till date is hydroxyurea, because it reduces the amount of neutrophilic and uh, retic count, it re induces fetal hemoglobin, and so it reduces the interaction of neutrophil with the endothelium, reduces RBC hemolysis, causes release of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. And it reduces the risk of crisis from median of 
uh, 4.5 to 2.5, longer median duration to first crisis. That's also there. Maximum tolerated doses may not be same for everybody. We use around 20 mg per kg. Many patients still experience recurrent VOCs on hydroxyria, and people are scared that there's a malignant anti-malignancy drug. And people have been using it for 20, 25 years. There's not been any problem as such, but fertility surely gets hit with hydroxyria. So we need newer agents. Infection is a big, big thing after VOC because of splenic dysfunction. And remember that you may have to vaccinate. The most important thing is to vaccinate for pneumococcal. These are the guidelines, depending on whether you're fully vaccinated or not. We usually prefer giving a polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine every five years. You can give a meningococcal and the hemophilus. We just, whenever it's available, we give the hemophilus B. Meningococcal, the one which you have is not good for epidemics, so that's the one we omit. So we just give the pneumococcal and the hemophilus influenza. So the very important thing is we need to improve the documentation of pain because it's a subjective uh, phenomenon. We need to improve the communication between healthcare professionals and the patient. So the patient, the patient needs are understood by the healthcare worker. There's a lot of unmet need in sickle cell disease because patient, doctors cannot interpret what the patients are saying and patient uh, prodrome of a VOC is probably taken as psychological rather than being of real physical importance. And hydroxyurea needs to be given to every sickler and it has to be monitored with the CBC. That has to be remembered very clearly. To summarize the whole thing, VOC is maybe only the tip of the iceberg when it, when it comes to vasoclusive crisis. It's a multicellular addition that's very important for vasoclusion VOC, which is a vicious circle as I showed you in the presentation. And ultimately, vasoclusion VOC leads to end organ damage, multi organ damage may lead to death. VOC may be associated with increased risk of death at early age. VOCs can be managed with hydration, supplemental oxygenation, appropriate analgesia, and high, uh, where temperature maintenance, that's very, very important. Sickle cell disease patients may avoid seeking healthcare assistance during a VOC because of stigma around OPID use, poor knowledge of the provider, all those things are there. But remember that we have to create awareness that sickle cell disease patients can live to 60 decades, seven decades. And uh, there are other forms of management therapies at the present moment, like transfusion hydroxyria, which has to be provided to multiple people. And going forward, we think that crizanlizumab, which is a drug which blocks the T-selectin, could help us, our patients, in leading a better life. So that's that for VOCs and sickle, and how it's just not the, it's not just the sickling that's important, it's the inflammation, the multicellular addition that's important. That's the whole point of this presentation that we gave today. So I would like to thank everybody for being patiently hearing all this. And I would like to thank Novartis for their assistance in creating awareness about sickle. Thank you, thank you everybody.